Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague. And my guest this week is a speaker, author, venture capitalist, investor, jazz guitarist, and host of the Creative Troublemakers podcast. His name is Josh Linkner. He's right there. Uh, we're going to talk with him about what it's like to play for a living and how you can find a little more fun, flow, and fulfillment in your life. You can find Josh and his new book, Big Little Breakthroughs at biglittlebreakthroughs.com. You can find Playful Humans at playfulhumans.com. And you can take a playful personality quiz, see what type of playful person you are. Playfulhumans.com slash quiz. Here we go. Josh, welcome to the podcast. We like to start with the joke of the week. The joke of the week is brought to you by dry erase boards. Dry erase boards, out of all the inventions in the last 100 years, have to be the most remarkable. Uh huh. All right. Uh, here's another joke. Though. The actual joke of the week, uh, one you can share with your friends. What do they call Miley Cyrus in Europe? What do they call Miley Cyrus in Europe? Any ideas? Oh. Kilometer Cyrus. All right, uh, that'll get us going there on the right foot. Uh, is it kilometer or kilometer? Kilometer, Cyrus? Is that funnier? <laughs> uh, so, Josh, you obviously have a lot going on here, but I love that you have, uh, that you're kind of a, a voice of creativity, especially in the business workplace. Uh, you do angel uh, investing or, or uh, venture capital investing. So with a lot of startup companies, you've built and sold five different companies. And so I think sometimes for me, people struggle with either being serious and I'm gonna be a professional business person or I'm gonna go play for a living and be fun. How have you blended the two? Well, you know, first of all, I'm like, thanks for having me today. I'm delighted to chat about play. And I, I totally 100% agree with you that we need more play in our professional lives. You know, we often think that play is fun and work isn't fun, but work is productive and play is not productive. And I think that's a, there's a real fallacy there. In fact, I think when we play through our problems and when we have a play force instead of a workforce, I actually think we become more productive. If we think about it, the, the quote unquote hard skills of the past have largely been automated or commoditized. And what's left is the imagination and human creativity and abstract thinking. And these are things that you don't work out, you play out. So I think that not only is play in the workforce more fun and more intrinsically rewarding, it's actually more productive. Uh, I totally agree. And that's kind of the whole point uh, of this podcast and this mission for me is helping people figure that out, that you're, you're more productive, you have better ideas, uh, happier people get uh, better reviews and have a higher net promoter score. And, and when you go down the line, basically more engaged and the more fun your employees are having, the better your company does and profitability and retention and uh, lack of turnover and everything. So it's kind of amazing to me that people are still like, oh, we got to grind. And I think that I was going to ask you about that, even in entrepreneurship and starting companies, there's kind of a myth out there, right? That you have to grind and and pay your dues and it has to be really hard for you to be successful. H have you found that to be true? Yeah, I think we, we, we co-mingle two different things. I mean, certainly hard work, grit, determination, like those are important things, whether you're doing a startup or a big company or raising a family. And, and so sort of, you know, again, I hate the term hard work because again, we're, I, I'd rather say hard play, but, but the idea of, you know, putting yourself out there and, and having you know, follow through and discipline and stuff, those are important things. That being said, they don't have to be miserable. Like you can play hard instead of work hard. And so, so the idea isn't, again, so, so too many people have these two different parts of their lives, work, which is the soul sucking experience that they trade their life for money and then play, which they actually enjoy themselves. And I think that they can really be fused together again to be more productive and get way more intrinsic rewards and fulfillment out of the quote unquote work. Um, so I play jazz music. I've been playing for 40 plus years. I put myself through college playing music. And, and when I quote unquote work at, at, at jazz, yeah, I am exhibiting discipline. I'm sacrificing perhaps because I'm not out, you know, drinking a beer because I'm, I'm, I'm practicing my, my, my craft. But at the same time, it's not bad, it's fun and I'm playful and I'm enjoying and I'm pushing the creative boundaries. So I just really think that we shouldn't think that play means unproductive. And if you're having any fun at all, that means you're not hustling hard enough. We can hustle and still have fun at the same time. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree there. And before we get too far, let's talk about um, your new book and, and what you have going on, a Big Little Breakthroughs. Obviously, you got the play on, on words there, but tell us about that and what's the, what's the story of that book? Well, in the same way that you are sort of breaking the myth that, that work has to be soul crushing and play is unproductive, um, I'm trying to break some myths as well. So I'm a, a big, passionate student of human creativity and innovation. Again, I really believe it's the lifeblood of society and business alike. The problem is we have this misconception that, you know, for innovation to count, it has to be a billion dollar idea. And the only people that can be innovative are people that are wearing a lab coat or a hoodie. And, and so essentially we look at innovation as important, but not for us. Only some people are creative and I can't be. And so it's like this, this elite club or something, Big Little Breakthroughs does the opposite. It helps people, it's sort of like innovation for the rest of us. It helps us all build our own creative chops in small ways. I encourage people to think small. And in fact, what we learn is that practicing small daily acts, think of creativity as a habit, not a once a decade bet the world on, for, it, it de-risks the process. It's more fun. We certainly get to play more. And, it, and, and as you make it part of your daily life, you actually build skills. And so not only do those little ideas amount to big things because you're doing a lot of them, you actually become better at creativity and ultimately you can uncover the bigger breakthroughs that you see. So it's sort of a, a way to de-risk the process. It makes it accessible for us all, regardless of role or position or background or gender or any of that. And, and it really allows all of us to be an artist in our own way. Uh, I, I like that. And it brought up two things for me. One is I actually love little creative breakthroughs or little unique ways to solve problems that might not be big problems in, in your life. But it reminded me of, of one of my, my favorite moments. I think when I was really young and working in restaurants, I worked in the 70s theme uh, restaurant where we did the YMCA and danced on the tables, all that kind of stuff. And they had lava lamps on the table and the cord for the lava lamp was plugged in right behind it. And there were like four people trying to figure out why the cord was pushing the lava lamp crooked. And they were trying to do all kinds of things. And the lava lamps mounted to the table. And the, the cord obviously has to plug in where it is. And they're all sitting there trying to figure it out. And I came up and I just moved the table an inch to the left. And the lava lamp fell back into spot. And I was like, you guys have a good day. Now you can go back to your work. And I was like, moving the table is completely different than trying to fix this problem you weren't going to fix right in front of you, right? And that's such a great analogy for all these kind of creative breakthroughs that when you when you see something somebody else does and or you change the rules of the game that's a big deal even if it's a small rule right I'm so glad you pointed that example out because again we think of the face of innovation as you know whatever Elon Musk or something and again that feels so off-putting for most of us but what you did there with that table and the lamp that is daily that's that's a big little breakthrough and those big little breakthroughs are absolutely within the grasp of each of us so when we think we don't need to change jobs or companies, we can think of ourselves as an artist, as a creator, again, in the context of the daily work. And, and those little ideas like that, those add up to giant, incredible results. In fact, Harvard ran a study, turns out that 72% of the United States gross domestic product, GDP, comes from big little breakthroughs, comes from small ideas. So in the media, we celebrate, you know, again, Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or something, but, but it's really those small ideas. Those are the lifeblood. If you run a restaurant, it's, it's, it's having a slightly different way to cook the burger or whatever. And again, these might not make you famous, but they absolutely make you successful. Well, and that brings me to my, my second point there, which is a lot of people, if you set out to change the world, you're already thinking like too big that it stops your creativity or, or it becomes um, kind of demotivating that uh, I know Jeff Bezos wanted to build a huge company, right? But he didn't start that way. He started with books and started in his garage and he, he didn't say, oh, I'm going to build the next billion dollar company, right? He was trying to um, find something that worked. And then when it works and it's fun, it scales. If you're trying to push it and you're trying to come up with this massive breakthrough, a lot of times that's what's preventing you from doing it, right? Yeah, I, again, it can, it can be off-putting and it seems so risky. You know, again, if we think innovation only counts if it's giant and, and you think that it only counts if it's risky, it's sort of like your premise about work. It's just too easy to just do nothing and when the stakes are that high. So it's, it's really the, the idea of, again, democratizing and making it within the grasp of us all. And, and by the way, you don't have to shy away from big problems to still use big little breakthroughs. A quick example. So there's a guy and, and, and the whole book that I wrote, Big Little Breakthroughs, it's all about celebrating everyday innovators. Honestly, I feel like I'm on this mission to like help everyday people become everyday innovators. So a person you've probably never heard of is this guy who lives in London named Trowin Resterick. 
So Trump and I interviewed for the book, he's this cool guy, but he's just like you and me, like he struggled in college. He wasn't a superstar athlete. He got a regular job after he graduated, just trying to pay the bills. But, but Truman really was driven to environmental causes. He just, in his heart, he loved nature, wanted to preserve nature. Well, it turns out that in central London, the single biggest litter problem is cigarette butts. People, you know, smoke their cigarettes and toss them on the street. And it's not, it's, it's unsightly, it's hazardous for small animals and children, it's bad for the environment, et cetera. And, and, and the typical ways you solve this problem haven't worked. You try shaming people into putting out their cigarettes, right? And, and nothing really works. So what does Trevin do? Trevin is an everyday innovator. Again, just like you and me, comes up with a big little breakthrough, which he calls the ballot bin. So a ballot bin, it's, it's, a, it's a bright yellow spray painted metal receptacle that is mounted like on a post. So it's kind of eye level. The front of it is glass, you can see it. And there's a divider down the middle. At the top of the ballot bin, it asks a question. It's a two part question, like which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? And there's a little receptacle where it allows people to vote with their butts. So you put your butt in, like if you like pizza more, yeah. and then you can see it, it falls out of the other cigarettes. You can see an instant tally. It's like two bar charts next to each other. And it's the simplest thing. It didn't require high tech. It didn't require like a military grade budget. He didn't have like 13 PhDs. But what happened? It reduced cigarette litter by 80%. And now Trellin has these things that are in 27 countries. So he's taking on like a meaningful problem and he did it in an in, in everyday way, in a big little breakthrough kind of way. So when I hear stories like Trellin, I just love sharing that stuff because to me, that means that it's accessible to every one of us. If Trellin can do it, so can we. Oh yeah, I think that's a great example and a way to, to make it fun, right? It doesn't matter. They're not voting on political issues or they're not making it weird. I mean, maybe they are in some places, but like you said, like pizza or burgers, that's an easy, fun thing and it still works. You reminded me there of, uh, have you seen the escalator uh, versus the stairs thing where um, they put like the musical notes on the stairs and it went from 80% of people taking the escalator to 80% of people taking the stairs just by making it fun and just by a little breakthrough like that, that, that changes the game for people. And you got, you know, way more employees taking the stairs and doing something that's actually harder because it's more fun. And, and that's what I think a lot of people don't realize. That's exactly right. And, you know, your whole theme around play is perfect. I mean, to a degree, Trowin made the act of disposing of cigarette butts playful. And by the way, those butt, you can customize those. You can put any two-part question you want. And some of them yeah. are provocative, like, you know, Trump's hair, real or fake, you know, and so you can put anything <laughs> you want on it. And it's, it's very fun. But, but you're right. You're absolutely right. When you inject fun into a situation, it automatically elevates the output. And, and I found this to be true with brainstorming, with creativity in general, and even with sales, which I know you're very passionate about, but, but you inject a little fun and, and the results just, as, they, they elevate. Now, tell me about your career and, and stuff, because it seems like you have done an interesting thing here of designing a career that's not the typical career path. And that's what I love to talk about on this show is everybody um, kind of thinks the American dream is go to college, get good grades, check all the boxes. Then you get a nice paying job and you get to buy a house in the suburbs and, um, and that all works out for you. And it, it largely, I think, does. Uh, but for me, what's missing there is excitement, fun, creativity, any type of, of innovation that you're talking about too. So um, did, did you follow that path at all or were you always looking for these different outside the box career choices? Yeah, I, I didn't follow that at all. And I'll, I'll share my path, but, but just let's, let's examine the, the fallacy there of that American dream story you described. So, you know, yeah. keep your head down, do what you're told, get a good job, stay there for 30 years, re retire with a pension. But we know for sure that that's, that's way riskier than, than, than people think. You know, people transfer jobs all the time. There's downsizing, et cetera, et cetera. And the worst part of it isn't even the, you know, the, the living in the suburbs or whatever, but it's the regret. You know, so many people at the end of their lives look back and say, I, I had a calling and I never pursued it. I, I knew I was here for a purpose to leave my mark. And instead I took the, the, the safe quote unquote route only to learn that that safe route was the riskiest thing of all. And so what I did is the total opposite. Um, and by the way, I'm a normal guy. Like I grew up in the city of Detroit. I didn't have a trust fund, you know, like I'm not, you know, just, just to be clear, but <laughs> so I put myself through college playing jazz music. I started a company at age 20. I'd never taken a business class before. And I just said, Hey, if I can, improvise my way through playing jazz. Maybe I can figure out a business. And, and I made a ton of mistakes, by the way. It wasn't perfect. I screwed up a bunch of stuff, but I learned. And so over the next, you know, I won't bore you too long, but, but over the next 30 years, I started, built and sold five technology companies and, uh, you know, grew, grew into being an entrepreneur, which by the way, is very similar to playing jazz music. It's this, so you have to be a good listener and you're always figuring stuff out and adapting. 
And uh, I then yeah. w- wanted to help my hometown of Detroit. So we started a venture capital fund. So I helped to get about a hundred startups off the ground. And uh, that's fascinating too, to help you know, other entrepreneurs to, to, to develop their own creativity and make a difference. And I've since written four books on the topic of, again, my passion, human creativity. And, and again, I just feel like, I hope they put it on my tombstone, man. Like, like I just want to help everyday people become everyday innovators. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, it's amazing. And you're, you're right. I mean, how many people even qualify for a pension today? What, there's like four unions left that have pensions and in the railroad and, uh, you know, some, some jobs like that. But uh, most of us in the corporate world don't have that. And we're not guaranteed a job. I think a lot of us figured that out in 2022, right? Nobody's guaranteed uh, anything from the company, even if you do do a good job and work hard and, and uh, you know, keep your head down there. So yeah, the risk and everything is, is interesting. But um, tell me about uh, creativity, because I think that is one that you're an expert. I want to make sure that we talk about this because you have four books worth of knowledge and, and we have about, you know, five, 10 minutes. But um, if you had, you know, kind of anybody that is just a typical, you know, human working in, in an office job, what would you encourage them to do to, to be more creative? Well, so here's the good news. And, and, and again, I've re- been researching creativity for a couple decades that, that as human beings, we are hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. I like to say, if you're breathing, you're creative. And too many of us think that, you know, one out of a thousand of us are born creative and the rest of us have to suffer. And that, that's just not true at all. And in fact, the research has sa- says that um, basically all, all human beings, Creativity is about 85% learned behavior. So yes, there are some people who are born maybe a little more you know, propensity or whatever, but you and me have at least 85% the creative capacity as Mozart or, or Da Vinci or Picasso. The thing is, it's a skill. It's a learned skill, just like learning a language, just like learning how to play tennis, just like learning how to do jazzercise. And so for, for us, we just got to first of all say, okay, it's a skill that I can learn. It's within my grasp. Now, by the way, we all can express creativity in different ways. I play jazz guitar pretty well. I can't draw a stick figure if I try. So, so if you are listeners, you know, like say, oh, well, I'm not good at music or interpretive dance or poetry or something, doesn't mean you can't be creative in your own ways. So I think first of all, it's, it's let's identify the areas that we can be creative in and then let's look for those little teeny opportunities. Don't swing for the fences, look for little teeny, big, you know, big little breakthroughs, micro innovations. And, and the more we practice, the more we make it part of who we are, the better we get. You think about Da Vinci. So, you know, the Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world, that wasn't his first painting. Da Vinci first right. had to learn to paint and he had to learn to, he painted terrible paintings and he screwed stuff up. And over time, he developed those skills. So I encourage people to just start injecting even a little bit of creativity into their daily lives. And it can be something as simple as like, hey, how do I, uh, what, what would happen if I order my pizza with the pepperoni under the cheese? Like it doesn't have to be a, a groundbreaking thing. Just add a little bit of creativity where you're, you're kind of pushing the boundaries of what is in favor of what can be. Yeah, I, I love that. And it, for me, it is about that being willing to fail and, and make a mess and, and, uh, and not be good at something, right? We've all got so much intense pressure. And especially now with social media and stuff, we feel like we have to share everything and have this polished professional brand image uh, as a person. And nobody's willing to, to take risks to mess up or to be bad at something first. And, and that's what a lot of creativity is just changing anything and trying something and, and going, well, this may or may not work. Uh, but that to me is the interesting part of life, right? If we know that everything's going to work, then like you said earlier, it's kind of just checking the boxes and we're going to be bored for the rest of our life. The only way to make it interesting or, or make a memory is to... Um, have fun and, and try something that might not work, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, so in the research for the book, which I actually invested this new book, over a thousand hours of research and interviews. And I had the privilege to interview people all over the world, you know, CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders. But I also interviewed lots of like everyday people like Trowan who are doing cool stuff. Anyway, what I discovered is that there are eight obsessions, kind of core mindsets that everyday people like you and me tend to embrace to become innovative. And I obviously cover them in a lot of depth in the book, but um, one of them that you, you talked about, which is sort of, uh, you're not being afraid of making mistakes. One of the core principles, we call it fall seven times, stand eight, which is a, a principle actually that it was borrowed from a Zen proverb. But the idea behind it is that, you know, mistakes are part of the process and, and, and mistakes aren't fatal. They're, they're more like the portals of discovery. 
And so you're right, we do need to get a little more comfortable making a mistake here too. The, the idea here is to control it. So you don't, you don't make like a catastrophic mistake. You, you make one that's, that, that's easily recoverable. But um, the, 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 the principles are really fun in the book. So one of them, um, we call it start before you're ready, which is essentially like kind of get going, don't wait for permission or directive, don't wait till everything's perfect. You know, don't wait till you have 100% visibility and certainty. You sort of get going on something and then and adapt and figure it out as you go. There's a couple more playful ones though. One of them is um, uh, don't forget the dinner mint, which is essentially oh, the idea right. of looking for like a little teeny creative way to plus up a piece of work product. So whether you're sending an email or making a sales pitch or whatever your, your, your craft is, at the end of it, you say, okay, is there a way that I could add just a little extra something, a little dose of creativity to make, make, make mine stand out from the, from the pack? And then one other I'll just highlight real quickly is um, uh, we call it use every drop of toothpaste. And the whole notion there, uh, Mike, is that the, you know, most of us, the biggest objection, people say, well, I want to be creative, but I don't have the resources for it. And this is around being scrappy and figuring stuff out with the resources that you have at hand. And, and truly, if, if you think about it, if the amount of resources that someone has equals the size of their creative output, the federal government would be the most creative organization on the planet and right. startups would be the least creative. And we know the exact opposite is true. So again, the whole book is around de demystifying the creative process, debunking a lot of the myths and helping normal people get more creative. Well, I love those two that I talk about all the time is it doesn't cost anything to be awesome. Um, that's free. You, you just need a little bit of time, which goes to your other point. There is I try and tell people like, take 30 seconds, take 30 seconds to think about how you could make it more creative, more fun. And, and like you said, just put a little twist on something uh, before you, you launch it and, and send it out. And I, I think we all get so busy and try and be so productive that we miss those moments. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about the podcast, because obviously we have some podcast listeners here. Tell me about Creative Troublemakers. What's that show and, and uh, who should listen to that? So Creative Troublemakers is a podcast that we've been working on for over a year. And it's really fun. We, we, we've interviewed incredible people like the ones that I'm describing here uh, today. We've interviewed uh, people, you know, amazing nonprofit leaders and, and again, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, um, retail giants, all kinds of people. But it's really about their philosophy of making creativity a daily practice. And so um, the show is actually uh, slated to come out in the next month or two. Uh, and you can sign up if you want to get on the, the list for uh, uh, creativetroublemakers.com. Awesome. Uh, well, sounds great. So here at the end of the podcast, we like to play a game, uh, but I tell people that you can't force fun. So I'll give you the choice. Would you like to play or would you like to walk away, Josh? Oh, are you? I mean, I'm all in on playing for sure. <laughs> all right, here we go. We're going to spin our wheel of games and see what we got here. Okay, this is a you choose. So you're the first uh, person on the podcast that's been able to make up a game. Do you have a favorite game that uh, you like to play for creativity or, or innovation? Yeah, I do. It's called role storming. So most of us are familiar with, familiar with brainstorming, which by the way, was invented in the late 50s and uh, totally out of date. And, and it's a perfectly designed exercise to yield mediocre ideas because fear creeps in the room and we share our safe ideas, not our crazy ideas. Role storming fixes that. So role storming, you're taking on an actual real world challenge, the way you wouldn't brainstorming, but you're pretending that you're somebody else. You're brainstorming in character. So you could be Steve Jobs, you could be Muhammad Ali, you could be um, Lady Gaga, anyone that you want. And you pretend that you are that person as you tackle the challenge. So let's, let's role play if you're cool with it. All right. I got, uh, I got one. I got a good character. What, uh, what problem should we solve? Maybe um, how to get uh, more... Uh, buyers of your book and, and more listeners to the podcast. So maybe just build an audience would, would be a, a good, good thing to, to roll storm. I love it. Let's figure out how to build an audience together. And, um, and, and right now, so the, the rule is you can choose any character you want, living or dead, fictional or, or real. And all you're going to do is basically pretend that you are that character uh, as we take on the, the challenge. So who, who did you choose to become? Uh, my favorite impression to do is Christopher Walken. Uh, how about you? Oh, that's a good one. The actor, Christopher Walken. Um, in this one, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a six-year-old. A six-year-old. All right. Yeah. Uh, so how can we build an audience for our, uh, our creations? So uh, one thing that I would do as a six-year-old is, is say, you know, make it so I can understand it and, and also make it fun. And so too often people with ideas, big complex ideas, they're so complicated, people can't understand them. And, and the six-year-old say like, all right, make it colorful and fun. That's, you know, again, 
by the way, I think it's important to note that what we want to do in, a, in an idea jam like this, again, I don't even like the term brainstorming, is, yeah. is come up with the beginning of an idea, not the final work product. We're, we're, these are little sparks, not, not you know, bulletproof answers. So they're beginnings, not endings. So that's my first one is let's make it fun. Let's make it colorful. And Josh, I think what I would do is uh, put on a show. Maybe you could have celebrities endorse uh, your product and that way you could get more excitement uh, around it. You know, uh, I think I switched to a, a different impression there towards the end. Uh, I went a little Arnold Schwarzenegger, but uh, I like it. You got uh, any other ideas for us? Sure. So what, what other six-year-olds six -year -olds love treats? So maybe there's like the free prize inside kind of thing. And again, that, that's the beginning and end. So, so it might not be giving people candy, but maybe there's a little extra something like there's a free online toolkit, which actually my, my book has, but the idea of, you know, like what, what, what do you get with it? What's, what's bundled, what's extra value that, that would make it even more delicious. Awesome. I love it. Josh, thanks for playing and thanks for being on the podcast again. Biglittlebreakthroughs.com is the website for the new book. You can also go to joshlinkner.com and find out all the other stuff that Josh has going on. And uh, of course, for Playful Humans, you can go to playfulhumans.com and take the quiz. Josh mentioned that a lot of people play differently. He's a jazz guitarist. I like to build Lego. You can do different things too. Maybe you like to work out and exercise. Find out, take the quiz, playfulhumans.com slash quiz. Find out more information there. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, Creative Troublemakers Podcast, and the Playful Humans Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. Leave us a review, give us a thumbs up, help us out a little bit. And thank you for listening today. Go play. Play it forward.